right. Who can tell me what that actually means now? When a person lacks focus and then is constantly distracted by something so that they have a hard time performing that, that task that they're assigned to do. That's partially true, but also they're very physically stimulated too. They can't just keep still. So they're always, they feel the urge to just move around. So this condition is very uh, prevalent in children and adolescents, and it can continue into adulthood. Uh, the children usually uh, that have ADHD uh, have difficulties, as I said, uh, paying attention and concentrating. And they often easily feel bored and frustrated uh, when they have to complete tasks. They move around uh, constantly and are impulsive, and they don't uh, often stop to think before they act. And uh, the biggest problem with ADHD in these children are their performance at school. And the uh, problem with ADHD for adults is uh, at work they have uh, difficulty with time management, organizational skills, achievement and setting their goals, and ultimately employment. Okay, so in children and adults, about three, three to eight percent of the children need uh, DSM-4 criteria, which we'll go over. That criteria basically is a uh, list of uh, signs and symptoms uh, that often are associated with ADHD. Uh, ADHD is about two to three times more prevalent in uh, males than it is in females. And uh, the symptoms often start uh, uh, the age of three to seven. That's usually when children begin to develop uh, develop more uh, fully speed talk and uh, you'll notice the symptoms much quicker. And uh, usually with the appropriate therapy we can deal with the condition, but uh, in about 30% of the cases it progresses into adulthood. The important thing to say though is about 1 in 10 people are often uh, undiagnosed with ADHD and that's a problem because uh, they'll just go into adulthood not knowing what they have. And that will affect their productivity in society. Uh, oh, and it's uh, usually accompanied by another psych psychiatric disorder in about two thirds of patients. So on the next slide, we have a huge list of signs and symptoms uh, that are associated with ADHD. Uh, the next slide, is the DSM-4 criteria I was talking about. Now patients have to have uh, several of these criteria to actually be diagnosed with uh, ADHD or ADD. So we see careless mistakes, difficulty sustaining attention, and all these pretty much see on TV when they talk about ADHD. Now uh, on the next slide, we'll uh, talk about the pathophysiology of ADHD. Uh, it has a lot of causes. It can be uh, genetic and uh, non-genetic. Now, uh, when you have a first degree relative with ADHD, you yourself have a four to eight times uh, more likelihood of getting ADHD. And if your twin, identical twin, uh, has it, then you yourself have a 90% chance of getting ADHD. Now, uh, there's also many other risk factors associated with this, uh, from other smoking, you know, just have, being raised in a poor environment can trigger it. Uh, there's uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, lead poisoning, meningitis, all those things can also impact the child and uh, trigger ADHD. On the next slide, uh, it mentions some uh, brain areas, uh, the human uh, brain, and these areas are uh, can be negatively impacted. And when they are, it affects the chemical chemical uh, uh, are they chemoreactors? I think they're called, but uh, it affects them in a disproportionate way. And depending on where it's affected, uh, will affect how uh, sensitive a medication will be on a specific patient. Uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I didn't go into it in full detail because it's very, very complex. So, uh, the next slide is 
uh, non-pharmacological treatment. And things we can do to help ADHD in children uh, include stopping anticholinergic drugs. Those are drugs that usually cause dehydration, uh, drying of mucous membranes. And you can also stop antihistamines like Benadryl and uh, any first generation uh, antihistamines that cause drowsiness. Those are things you want to stop. Uh, parents can also uh, be more disciplined uh, with their children and uh, try to train them to control their symptoms. Uh, positive re encouragement and reinforcement also works uh, with children and uh, it can also work with skill development. Pharmacotherapy uh, for this disease includes uh, central nervous system stimulants psychostim and or psychostimulants. Uh, however, tricyclic uh, antidepressants have been shown to work, as well as atomoxetine, bupropion, and clonidine. Uh, stimulants that are norepinephrine or dopamine agonists have also shown to be beneficial in ADHD. Now, over here, uh, ADHD is uh, associated with seven comor comor uh, comorbidities like Tourette's, bipolar, and uh, uh, anxiety or depression. For the purpose of this lecture, we're just going to talk about how to treat uh, ADHD itself and not with its comorbid comor comorbidities. However, if you're interested, you can see uh, the treatment algorithm is listed over here. Hey guys, what's up? Okay, so I'm going to go over some of the drugs that are commonly used to treat ADHD. Now, some of the factors that involve drug choice. Uh, the initial thing is that, that we have to take into account is the efficacy that of each agent that's uh, given to the child. Um, also, because uh, some people, they're naturally more inclined to be uh, more uh, responsive to one agent, maybe uh, methylphenidate, while another one is more responsive to amphetamines. It's really, uh, there's no really predetermined focus on it. There's really no scientific method that we can use to kind of determine which to use. It's more you try one, if that doesn't really work, you want to one. So um, another two things we have since we are targeting a um, children and then an adolescent population, we have, to, uh, we have to take into account coverage time. So kids, they go to school. So we want to, we want to give them a formulation that they can take early in the morning, you know, 7, 8 a.m., and then and it'll last six, seven hours when they're in school. So you want to maybe take into account that. So you want to choose a long after formulation rather than a tablet that you can take, you know, four or five times a day. Um, take some kids that can't swallow pills, so you know, maybe a capsule, you can break it apart and sprinkle it in their food or drink. And also expense, since uh, some of these drugs can get very expensive, you want to try ones with a generic that's available. Um, like I said before, extended release, release formulations, they provide consistent and sustained coverage. And uh, that way you don't really need to get a teacher or a school nurse involved in administration. And there's fewer administrations because <coughs> kids are, we're trying to treat ADHD here, so if you want something, maybe there may be some issues with adherence. The child may not remember because of the ADHD, take a medication every four to six hours. So you want to give them that one tablet or, I'm sorry, one capsule a day, and they're done for that day, and then you uh, enhance adherence to that method. Um, however, some kids, they do need more than just that one simple extended release formulation once a day. So you can include a short acting agent, a tablet, for, like an Adderall tablet that will uh, help them during uh, when they're studying in the evening, when the long acting formulation. Some of them, they, you know, most of them, they're marketed as working for 12 hours, but that's not necessarily true. So you know, in the evening around 4 or 5 o'clock, when they're going to study for an exam, so you can take that short acting agent to kind of just get a boost of response. So like I said before, um, the first line therapy uh, is either methylphenidate or amphetamine, or amphetamine mixed salts. Uh, they're both considered for first line, and it really depends on the preference of the provider, the family, and, and then at, and how the child responds. Some children just naturally respond better to one and display less adverse effects with one compared to the other. There really is no way to predetermine pre this, so 
kind of just, it's basically trial and error. You try one, see if it works. You, you know, try it for a week or two, and then you go back to the doctor, and then, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Um, and like I, like I say, it's here, there's about half the children who do not positively respond to one, definitely respond better to the other. So again, it's trial and error. Um, in terms of dosing, uh, because these medications do have a history of addiction and uh, well, after once you're on it, there seems to be a phenomenon where you have you need this medication to function on any basis or you just can't simply. So you really want to start with the lowest dose possible based on the based on the ADHD and the level that is affecting the child or the adolescent. So you begin with a low dose and you try to every three to seven days. Um, you know, you fit and then you always want to uh, have a face-to-face -face follow up with a clinician after at least a fourth week to determine whether you want to try different, you want to go from maybe a methylphenidate to an amphetamine or vice versa. Uh, and you use a DSM uh, for based uh, rating scales to determine this and you know, based on relief of symptoms versus the prevalence of any adverse events, you want to switch it out based on you know, the ranks that they uh, provide. This, this is just a list of the various different uh, formulations that are available. You can see the Phetamine Mixols company and Mixols formulation. There's an extra amphetamine, uh, pure extra amphetamine formulation. There's a uh, more purified uh, Vibans, which is the more purified uh, amphetamine. It's the uh, allies more of it. And there's methylphenidate. There's extended release Concerta. There's Oakland. So these are all just some of the different various uh, formulations that are available on the market today for to treat ADHD. And again, it's based on the child's needs, the child's preferences, how they react in the body, and also cost and the circumstances of the child. Uh, other, there's also you know, the listed here, the uh, second and third line uh, drugs that are kind of commonly used. That's uh, Stratera, Adamoctetine, and uh, Guanfacine and Quantine. Talk about those well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some uh, side effects of monitoring you have to do with uh, stimulants. So, uh, can you guys name me uh, one or two stimulants that's on the phone over? Of the stimulants that we just went over. That whole thing. One? I don't know what that means. All right, so say a patient comes in and we have to talk to them about it. We want to talk to them about uh, when their child starts taking it, their child might experience appetite suppression or weight loss. Now mothers will get very worried about this. One thing you can tell them to take care of this is give them a high calorie meal with the medication, uh, either at breakfast or bedtime. Or we can recommend uh, calling the doctor and uh, uh, asking to prescribe cyprocaptine. Now, uh, stimulants can also cause insomnia. So the best thing we can do with this medication is advise the patient to take it in the morning. This ensures that uh, by uh, bedtime, uh, with these medications, the half-life will 